Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michel Legault. I'm the Director of International Partnerships at UTT. I'll be your host for this ceremony. Uh, please take a seat. Um, I would like to thank first our two students for their musical performances, uh, Aurélien Juil for his interpretation of Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune, and Hong Chi Chen for the well-tempered clavier book by Juan Sebastian Bach. The ceremony will begin shortly. It was Aurélien Juil again playing Liebestrom by Franz Litz. Thank you, Aurélien. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome now Mr. Pierre Cor, President of University of Technology of Troyes. <clears throat> Thank you, Michel. <clears throat> Madame la Rectrice, 
délégué pour l'enseignement supérieur, la recherche et l'innovation de la région académique Grand Est, chère Fabienne, Monsieur le Président du Conseil départemental de l'Aube, cher Philippe, Madame la conseillère régionale représentant la région Grand Est, chère Véronique Marché, Monsieur le Conseil communautaire représentant de trois Champagne Métropole, cher Jean-Luc, Madame la directrice du campus des Comtes de Champagne représentant l'URCA, chère Anne, Monsieur le directeur du, de, du campus Supélec de Metz, cher Conrad, Monsieur le président fondateur du UTT, cher Paul, Chers collègues universitaires et académiques, chers récipiendaires, chers invités, chers amis. UTT is honored and it's I am particularly happy to welcome you on this day of the 20th anniversary of our doctoral school in engineering sciences. Please you can get seated. <clears throat> I should have started by this. To mark this event We have chosen to honor two eminent international scientific personalities who have marked their discipline in two fields particularly important for the strategy of our university, nanotechnologies and energy transitions, which is, by the way, central to the construction of EUT+, the European University of Technology, by giving them the title and insignia of Dr. Honoris Causa in recognition of their important contribution in these fields, namely Professor Naomi Halas from Rice University and the Brian Norton from TU Dublin. Before starting this ceremony, and in the absence of enough time to present you UTT in details, I have chosen to say a few words about the importance that our university has always given since its foundation by Paul Gaillard to the doctoral school. I credited in year 2000. It was written in 2020, but I think it was a, a mistake. Our doctoral school began its activities with around 40 PhD students and with great determination on the direction of Professor Jacques Duchesne until 2007. Since that, the doctoral school continued its sustained development under the direction of Professor Regis Langelet from uh, 2007 to 2017, who conducted a dynamic international development policy throughout various international programs to reach 80% of doctoral students admitted with foreign, foreign diplomas. Since 2017, Professor Kemae Sanuni manages the doctoral school for the current five-year period, 2018 to 2022. Along the way, 20 years after its start, The doctoral school has now 212 registered PhD students, 40% of whom are women. On this period, we have issued 613 doctoral degrees in various fields of engineering sciences. This school relies internally on five research units representing a human potential of about 400 people, including 100 Uh, professors and researchers, eight scientific and technological platforms, and three interdisciplinary institutes, namely the Institute for Global Security and Anticipation, Anticipation the Institute for Services and Industry of the Future, and the Institute for Technology and Health. Health. The research areas of these units are the following, automatic mesh generation and advanced methods, light nanomaterials nanotechnologies, mechanical and material engineering, computer science and digital society, and interdisciplinary research on society, technology, and environment interactions. I must also underline the constant will of UTT to make its doctoral school one of the instruments to develop its scientific and research strategy in complement of its engineering training. Indeed, UTT was created in 1994. It's based on a model set up at the creation of the UTC, the UT of Campiègne, in 1972, which was completely new at the time, allowing this type of school to claim at the same time the status of a university, but also that of a grande école of engineering, which is something very French. 
This model makes it possible for UTT to offer university training up to the doctorate degree, which is the only internationally recognized diploma, as well as engineering training. This dual training increasingly responds to the needs of companies that are obliged to put more and more emphasis on innovation in an increasingly competitive world. The training of excellence through research via the PhD constitutes a professional experience allowing the recognition of scientific skills, including the ability to propose innovating solutions, but also skills in terms of autonomy and responsibility. Among other things, it can allow an engineering student to deepen his or her end of study internship subject via a research subject for three years and consequently to learn to manage a project over the medium and long term. During these three years, the PhD student can develop capacities of perseverance and competitiveness. A last word to say that UTT's doctoral school is working with its counterparts in the seven other universities involved with, uh, with the UTT in the creation of a uh, European University of Technology, namely TU Dublin, Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences, Riga Technical University, cluj napoca University of Technology, Sofia University of Technology, Cyprus University of Technology, and Cartagena University of Technology. With our partners, we are building what could be the first European university, and we do so with the objective of finding solutions to face the dramatic transitions that our continent must face. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, President Kaur. Next, please welcome Professor Renaud Bachelot, Director of the Nanofut Graduate School at UTT. Thank you, Michel. So uh, today I'm very um, happy and very proud to present uh, Naomi, uh, Professor Naomi Haras from the Rice University, Houston, Texas, USA. <laughs> so uh, actually, for a few minutes, I, I would like to point out the main reasons why we selected Naomi for receiving the title of uh, Doctor of Honoris Causa of the University of Technology of Troyes. Alors, first of all, the main reason is, is your uh, scientific achievements, <laughs> for sure. So they are numerous, they are outstanding. So the list is very long, so I selected the two first examples. Uh, so you, you develop a new family of uh, nanoparticles made of uh, gold nanoshell, and you demonstrated that it's easy to control the, the thermal optical properties of these uh, particles, the new particles, for, for many applications, including the, the thermal uh, treatment of tumor. And this is, a, I guess, this is a story you are, you are going to tell us. So this is very, very important. As, an, as another example, you, you study the physics of uh, hot electrons. So hot electrons, this is a specific uh, state of excitation of electrons at, at, the, at the surface of metal nanoparticles. So this is, it can be, it can be uh, induced by very fast uh, optical excitation. And the duration of this state is very, very short, a few femtoseconds. But you showed that during this uh, uh, duration, we can use the electron for triggering chemical reaction. So this is, this is uh, and uh, using this phenomena, you demonstrated that it's possible to dissociate uh, hydrogen. So this is very important for, 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 um, for getting new knowledge about hydrogen in the context of, uh, of this uh, new, uh, new source of energy. So these achievements have been leading to impressive uh, track record. So basically, you, you publish more than 400 articles in a very high level journal, and they have been cited more than 100,000 times with an age factor of 150, which is very impressive. Basically, that means that at least uh, half of your published works have, have been uh, have, um, 
had a huge impact in many communities. So this is a congratulation for that. <laughs> Alors, uh, you, obviously you have been invited uh, at least uh, 600 times to, to present your work all over the world through a pl plenary uh, and key, keynotes, uh, plenary sessions and keynotes. So this is, uh, and you, you received many honors and awards. So again, the list is very long. Let, let, me, let me just cite two uh, very recent examples. You, recently, you became a fellow, the Hans Fischer Fellow of the, of the Technical University of, of Munich in Germany. And you, you also became a, a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the United Kingdom. So. Alors, a very important point, I, I, you, your international recognition also results from the fact that you always try to use, to apply your research for helping and serving people in society. So this is a very important point. So basically, society can count on you. Uh, let me give you two more examples. For example, you have been studying the, the, the physics of um, aluminum nanoparticles that shine by light, especially for shine by UV light from the sun. And you demonstrated that it, it's possible you, to, to, to use, to use the, the, this effect, uh, the, the, the physical effect, to treat uh, for, for water treatment, especially for making water drinkable, which is crucial and vital in, in many parts of the world. So, so this is something to point out. And as a last example, you used also uh, metal, uh, the nanoparticles uh, shine by light for producing alumina, alu aluma. No, uh, sorry, uh, ammonia, ammonia, sorry, ammonia, uh, which is so in the, in the environmentally uh, um, clean way, in the sense that it's very important if we consider that ammonia has been used for, for, for centuries for, as an agricultural agricultor, um, fertilizer and is a very promising uh, um, um, species for, for free, uh, carbon-free uh, transportation. So this is uh, very important. So actually, actually, it turns out that you, you, you have relied on your background in chemistry because you, you graduated uh, chemistry in chemistry, you, you graduated bachelor in chemistry, you graduated master in physics, you've got a PhD in physics, you have, you have been working for ATT Bell, for IBM, and uh, nowadays you, you've got uh, many uh, chairs of, as a professor in many departments, huh? let me cite them bioelectrical and compu computer engineering, biomedical engineering, physics, and astronomy. So, so, so your, your research is multidisciplinary in, in nature. And I, and I think this, uh, this, multi, this multi, multidisciplinary is just uh, the signature of, uh, of a very large open-mindedness. So this is a uh, congratulation for that. And finally, it turns out that you've got, you've got a lot of responsibilities. Uh, currently, you are, you are the, the director of the Smollett Curl Institute in Rice University, and you have been for five years also the director of the Rice Quantum Institute. So this is very important because that, these examples show that uh, people can count on you, and you've got the sense of uh, community service additionally to your personal motivation. So this is, this is something very important as well. Okay, so time is, time is running out. I have to, I have to stop. I, I, just, I just would like to, to, to thank you for your huge uh, scientific contribution. And I would like to, to thank you for accepting our invitation and for, for coming. The, the trip uh, with, with Peter, <laughs> the trip is long. <laughs> Thanks again for, for that and for, for visiting us, for visiting our, the beautiful city of Troyes. And especially thank you for accepting to become the, the patron of the new uh, nano optics and nano photonics graduate school that, that's going to be inaugurated tomorrow morning exactly right here. So thanks again. Thank you, Professor Bachelot. Now let's welcome Professor Naomi J. Alice.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we go into. Thank you very much for this honor. It's wonderful to be here and to be in this beautiful city of Troyes. And my talk actually starts on a topic that many of you are familiar with. Everyone here has seen the beautiful, beautiful stained glass windows in Troyes. This is a, in Chartres, not Troyes. But that means that everyone here has looked through a suspension of gold nanoparticles because the beautiful red color that you see is because of gold nanoparticles distributed in glass. And they absorb green light, and therefore they transmit the complementary color, red light. And it was Michael Faraday, the great British scientist who was also a great public speaker, that he would take a vial of gold nanoparticles so down below, you can actually see an image of na gold nanoparticles that he made back in the 19th century. It still exists. It's in the British Museum of Science and Technology. And this beautiful red light through, through, through the nanoparticle solution is something he would have in all of his public lectures. So <clears throat> what's really exciting about, about metal nanoparticles is not just their beautiful color, but the fact that they do some very, very important things. They interact with light so strongly that each particle will bend light around it, almost like a nano lens, and capture light from relatively far away. Bigger cross section than the actual particle. <clears throat> when it absorbs light, it can absorb many photons. It, can, it has very, very large photothermal effects. It also has very large fields near its surface. <clears throat> but so it's large photothermal effect, so it's a great nanoscale heating source. It also <clears throat> can be excited, and when, it, when its excitation, or what's is called its plasmon, decays, it can excite hot electrons, and one can do chemistry with that. So we'll talk about two topics today that are started as fundamental science in the laboratory and have moved completely into uh, the very exciting transfer of technology into some, in, 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 into, uh, some real life applications. So the first one is something called photothermal cancer therapy. Let me tell you how this starts. So as I just showed you the beautiful red color of a solid gold nanoparticle. If you make the particle hollow instead of solid, it can absorb the different colors of light. And you can actually make the particle absorb red light a little bit, a little bit further to the, to the red of the spectrum. And that's a special region of the spectrum that we also call, that bioengineers call the water window. If you've ever been in a hospital and they put a little clip on your finger and, the, and this red light that passes through, they're monitoring, they're, you, you notice two things. First of all, they monitor the oxygen in your blood. But you also notice, if you look at that little clip, that the light passes right through your fingertip. Green light doesn't do that, but dark, deep red light, or in light in the near infrared, it, uh, does that. So it's a region, of, it's a wavelength region called the water window. And this is a very important, has a very important properties. That light, as I said, just passes directly through the body. <clears throat> it's a region where we are transparent, essentially. <clears throat> so the light, can, the light can scatter in tissue, but it doesn't absorb particularly easily, which means it doesn't damage living cells. <clears throat> so we can make our nanoparticles, with specifically design them to absorb light directly in the wavelength region where we are most transparent. And and that gave rise to an idea that was, uh, was co-invented by myself and a wonderful collaborator, Jennifer West. <clears throat> um, and she was a bioengineer, so we came up with this idea. If I have, say, a tumor, so there, there's, you see my little mouse. So that mouse has a tumor on its side. <clears throat> and if I inject the tail vein into the tail vein of the mouse, if I inject those nanoparticles, they'll circulate throughout the bloodstream of the mouse. And eventually, they'll take up naturally into the tumor site. Because the blood vessels that a tumor grows are very chaotic. And they open up, and, they, and the nanoparticles end up there after several hours. After that, if we just shine that special wavelength of red light into the tumor, it goes right through the skin, right to the tumor. And the, skin, the, the tissue does not, the tumor itself does not interact with it, but the nanoparticles do. They absorb the light, convert the light to heat, and they, and they induce uh, hypother excuse me, hyperthermic cell death. They induce a heat-related cell death to the tumor. 
So as you can see on the bottom, we have a mouse, and you can see the actual image of the mouse with a tumor on its side. That's the day of treatment. At day 12, the tumor is gone. And in fact, the first time this experiment was done on a, set, on a, 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 a set cohort of about 20 mice, all of the mice survived. And that was a financial crisis, because when you do a cancer study, no, never did the mice ever survive. And here we had to pay, house, and feed all of these mice that survived. But that led us to start a company to eventually move this into clinical trials. Which, so after several years, <clears throat> we moved this into, into uh, tests in humans. The first one was head and neck cancer. And the second one was prostate cancer. The head and neck cancer trial went really well. But the prostate trial was a little bit strange. It didn't work well. Why didn't it work well? Let me tell you something about prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is a very, very common cancer in men. It's a cancer of the prostate gland. It is the second most common cancer to skin cancer. One in nine men in their lifetime will deal with a cancer diagnosis. But if they have a relative, like a father or a brother, with prostate cancer, that likelihood rises to about a fat one in three. So it is, uh, it, it is not just a common cancer, but unfortunately is quite a deadly cancer. Next to lung cancer, it is the second most deadly cancer in men. So I know quite a bit about this because my father was a prostate cancer survivor, so I know what the prostate cancer survivors go, go through in terms of treatment. So let me tell you a little bit about the diagnosis and a little bit about the, the therapy, the, 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 the process as one goes from diagnosis to therapy. So first you go to the doctor, he suspects that there's a problem with the prostate or the patient is having problems, then he goes to the medical laboratory and he tests for what we call in English the prostate-specific antigen, the antigen that rises, the antigen level rises when there is prostate cancer. <clears throat> and then they do a biopsy where they insert needles into the prostate to try to find out whether or not there is cancer there. And if there is a potential for cancer, then they enter a stage that they call active surveillance, where they wait for something worse to happen. And then after this waiting period, when they decide there needs to be treatment, then there are several treatment options, depending on how advanced the cancer is. Could be radiation, could be surgery where they remove the prostate, or it could be chemotherapy in very advanced cases. The problem with all of these treatments is that they have tremendous side effects. And these side effects are very negative and, re and result in a very, uh, in, in a, a loss of quality of life for mo the majority of prostate cancer patients. So both incontinence and impotence are, 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 uh, occur at very, very high rates. <clears throat> so why is it, why is it that when we did a prostate cancer treatment, it didn't, prostate cancer therapy, it didn't work well? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about the prostate and how we can image it. So before 2012, when you imaged a prostate, that's all you saw. You could see it, but you couldn't see anything inside. And it, we had to wait for a breakthrough in a completely different technology, in imaging, image processing, which took MRI images from a, from a excuse me, MRI images from, a, from an MRI tube, coupled with ultrasound images, and fused them together. So it's called a, uh, MRI ultrasound fusion imaging. And the fusion of these two allowed one to detect very clearly the interior of the prostate, so now the, now the doctor could directly image the region of the prostate that had the most suspect tissue. So this breakthrough then led to MRI, uh, to, 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 to MRI companies like Philips and Siemens now developing a real-time imaging method so that a doctor can put a needle in directly in that region not just randomly, not just blind in the way they did it before, but directly in that region where it looked like there could be a problem with a cancerous tumor within the prostate. That revolutionized their ability to diagnose cancer, and <coughs> diagnose prostate cancer. And so this was, um, so this, the name of this is, is a fusion, fusion biopsy or fusion guided biopsy. <coughs> it was invented by a young man named Art Rustenhod, who was part of the medical team that developed this imaging technology. He's also a urologist, so his specialty is the prostate. Um, and Dr. Canfield, Dr. Stephen Canfield, who you'll hear from in a minute, 
He knew about our work with nanoshells, and he also knew about the fusion guided biopsy. And he thought, well, why don't you, if, if, if you can put in a biopsy needle directly into a prostate tumor, you could also put an optical fiber directly into the prostate tumor. And if the nanoparticles are there, you could heat up directly just using the nanoparticles, because we use a, a, a power of light that's much lower than you would, that, that, that would normally damage the tissue, so the particles have to be there. And then this would create a much more effective therapy. And so this therapy, the commercial name is Oralase Therapy. <coughs> and um, so this is what we will so this, so this is exactly what this looks like. This actually in a patient, and this funny little grid platform is what they use to do the needle biopsy. But in this picture, instead of having needles, they actually have uh, entry points for the optical fibers themselves that are inserted into the prostate region. And you can see from the scale that this is a very, very delicate uh, region. The precision has to be with a millimeter precision in order to actually very safely ablate the tumor, but not harm any of these other uh, organs that are, that are very, very important to our normal bodily function. <clears throat> the side effects of treatment are well known. Uh, a man may be afraid of becoming impotent or becoming incontinent at a young age and therefore never seek treatment, never seek screening, and present with the cancer too late. And so I'm working for all of my patients who, who know uh, there are better things on the horizon and better treatments coming. Well, it started, I guess, about two, two, two and a half years ago. I came and saw Dr. Canfield, and, and he said, well, you know, it's this kind of tumor. It's sort of one of those that's sort of serious. It isn't serious. And he laid out all the options of the different kinds of things that could happen. And suddenly his face changed, and he had this twinkle in his eye. And he said, but you know, there's one other thing that you could try. And then he informed me of his treatment was the gold nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles absorb a color of light that passes uh, very easily through the human body. So if they're placed in a tumor, or if they collect in the tumor naturally, if you shine light on that tumor, the light will pass through the tissue and will be absorbed by the nanoparticles. They convert the light to heat, and they locally ablate just the cells very, very close to the nanoparticles themselves. The technology is innovative because it's, it's unique. We, we are putting an inert nanoshell in the human body, uh, taking advantage of natural tumor biology to, to localize the shell at the tumor site, and then lighting it up with laser energy to create you know, cell death. Or types of cancer like prostate cancer that require a very ultra-localized approach, this approach is absolutely ideal. It is so non-invasive to the patient that it's really, it's really game-changing. Patients may feel guilty sometimes. I've had patients tell me, I feel guilty that I got to do this when I know so many men who weren't able to participate in this trial or had never heard of it. As far as I was concerned, it was, it was excellent. It was a matter of simply all outpatient care, no complications, no pain, no discomfort. And at the end of it, you know, a year went by and my PSA is back to normal, my MRI is basically normal, and uh, at the present time I'm cured. To date, the clinical trial has been very successful. The goals of the trial being treatment of prostate cancer in a focal and localized manner with minimal to no side effects, at least not the standard ones of urinary control or sexual function, have all proven to be true. The technology works, so it's all very encouraging, and I do see a pathway in the future that this will be a commonly used procedure. I am so happy to see this wonderful treatment now being uh, pursued so successfully and really changing men's lives for the better. Any man who is offered the chance to have a focal treatment to get rid of his cancer rather than a radical treatment of his prostate with all of the side effects that come with that jumps at the chance. In fact, anybody who's been a candidate for this trial has not turned down the opportunity to participate. And that's because it is so compelling. It sounds too good to be true, but it really does work. The University of Texas is an incredibly supportive environment, allowing us to do our work with patients, but also innovative research like this. So we... So that's... Um... So, so where are we now? We are actually at the stage where this 
coming week will be the last set of patients to be treated before, uh, be, before the discussions about FDA approval. So the treatment, the, 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 the treatment success is actually above 90%, which is very exciting, and is, this is coupled with zero side effects. So uh, this is now being practiced in nine treatment sites across the United States. And so we certainly hope that this becomes that as of 2022, when FDA approval is very likely to occur, this is something that will also be extended to other countries. So we're very excited about that. Now I'm going to switch to a completely different topic. Because with nanoparticles and light, you can go into many different areas. And this is an important topic for many of us. This is a chemical plant. In, in Freeport, Texas, it's the Dow Chemical Company, and it's a very large chemical plant. When I visited there, they said to me, we have four, we have four energy reactors. One of our reactors can power Chicago. One of our reactors can power Chicago, which to me was stunning. <clears throat> and the truth is that if you look across all of industries, it's really the chemical industry that is the bad boy. They spend so much, first of all, they use fossil fuels to make many of the high value chemicals. That's understandable, but they also use fossil fuels to make the energy, to, to consume them, to make the energy that they need to actually do chemistry, which they do at very high temperatures and often at high pressures. So to think about chemistry, we really need to, so all chemistry requires a, a catalyst, and virtually all chemistry in, in industry is thermal. So it's responsible for all of these very important aspects of modern life, <clears throat> like plastics and chemicals and fuel. But it, it, it pay, we, we pay for this in the tremendous amount of emissions that result from just the chemical industry. So they need to figure out smarter ways to do chemistry in order to actually not be further distressing the global economy. And if we want to look at remediation of greenhouse gases and a cleaner planet, they must change the way that they do chemistry. We must change the way that we do chemistry. <clears throat> so the answer are metal nanoparticles. Metal nanoparticles have a collective electronic oscillation called a plasmon. When it decays, we can excite hot electrons, and those hot electrons can transfer to a molecule that sits outside the metal surface. So on the surface of those metal nanoparticles, you can do chemistry. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a very, very simple chemical reaction, simplest one we can think about. H2 is a very simple molecule. <clears throat> we flow H2 along, uh, along the surface of a gold nanoparticle. It will barely, it won't interact with the gold. The gold is very, very inert, as you know. <clears throat> but if it weakly fizzes and we shine light on the gold nanoparticle, then we can transfer an electron from the nanoparticle into the H2 molecule. Now it's H2 minus, it has Coulomb repulsion, and it separates at a much, much lower barrier than for the neutral molecule. You can actually do this, with th this chemical reaction using light at room temperature. In other words, in, 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 in conventional ways, you could do the same reaction at hundreds of degrees above room temperature. So the nanoparticles that we typically use, gold and silver are traditionally more sustainable metals are copper and aluminum, but they're not good catalysts. They're great at capturing light, as we saw earlier with the cancer therapy, but they're not good at doing chemistry. Any chemist or chemical engineer will tell you those are the elements that are really good for doing chemistry because the molecules you want to change will bind to those metals. So the question is, how can you combine the best of both worlds? And we can do this by a concept that we call an antenna, like the, the, the original optical nanoparticle, the original plasmonic nanoparticle, antenna reactor. So we combine both metals, we keep the antenna as it, it, it intact, and on its surface we bind these more reactive metals as small, as small islands on its surface. And so we can do light-driven reactions instead of heat-driven reactions uh, using, this type, using this type of concept. So we've done this with many different types of reactions. You literally design the nano part, the antenna reactor for a specific reaction, and you can change out the type of reactor that you use. It doesn't have to be a metal island. It can also be a semiconductor. It could be 2D material. It could be many other different variations, but it is a very, it's a very, very general concept and very practical concept. <clears throat> so one of the ways that people make hydrogen, I'll say more about hydrogen in a moment, one of the ways that, pe the, the main way that people make hydrogen in industry is a, is a process called methane reforming. So they take methane and they can actually, uh, they, they can use CO2, that's called dry reforming, they can use water, they ca that's called steam reforming, and they, they, they dissociate the, 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 the methane molecule 
consume the methane molecule and they make hydrogen. And they, they use, then they, of course, have, a, have, a, have a, a, a side product, in this case, carbon monoxide. But that's OK. They know that, that they can use that for other types of chemistry. So the combination of H2 and CO is called syngas. It's used exclusively. It's the largest feedstock in the entire chemical industry. <clears throat> but it, the problem with making this, with, using, with make, using this method to make hydrogen is that it consumes a huge amount of energy. You have to use very high temperatures, right? Temperatures around 1,000 degrees Celsius. So it means you have to do it in big stainless steel containers. And because it costs so much energy, you have to do it in, you have to use the economy of scale. You have to use very large chemical plants in order to do, in order to, to do this economically. <clears throat> and so we tried to do this with light. We designed an antenna reactor. And our, this is just to, I'll, I'll, I'll show you more about this in a moment. But, but basically, the combination of light versus heat uh, we found that we could do the light-based reaction at 600 degrees below what people typically did in industry. And that's a, that's a very transformative way. And also, we found that the, photo, that the efficiency of, of the photocatalyst compared to the conventional catalyst is much, much larger. The, 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 the photocatalyst has, has energy efficiencies of roughly 35%. So let's talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and it is an essential part of the world that we live in. It is used to produce many of the products that we use every day, like gasoline, plastic, and glass. It can also be used to generate clean energy and provide a sustainable future for our planet. Syzygy Plasmonics has developed a revolutionary new way to produce hydrogen. We are developing a first-of-its-kind chemical reactor. This reactor allows us to produce chemicals such as hydrogen at a lower cost and with fewer carbon emissions than is possible today. Our reactor contains a new type of material that was developed at Rice University. This catalyst material represents a revolutionary breakthrough for science. It is a highly specialized photocatalyst and it allows us to perform chemical reactions with light. This means that we do not have to burn fuel, which helps us to reduce emissions. And we can use simple materials like glass and plastic, which helps to reduce cost. Using this technology, CCG has developed a small-scale distributed hydrogen producing system that dramatically reduces the cost of hydrogen for our customers. Perhaps the most interesting of these customers are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. When we bring our first product to market, it will be capable of producing hydrogen fuel at a price point so low it can compete with gasoline. For every semi-truck, forklift, or passenger vehicle that we enable to switch from gasoline to hydrogen, it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by several tons per year. By making low-cost green hydrogen, we are helping the world take a strong step in the right direction. The hydrogen industry needs a novel technology to help it reach its true potential. Syzygy Plasmonics is here to provide that pioneering new technology. So who are these guys? So we, in, we, we invented, we, meaning Peter Nordlander and myself, co-invented uh, uh, antenna reactor particles, but the particles themselves are not enough. This group of young and courageous uh, uh, entrepreneurs licensed our nanoparticles, and they decided to build, as they said, a light-based chemical reactor. Well, they actually don't exist. So they had to design this, patent this themselves. And so it's a combination of our technology and their technology that really makes this, uh, that, that makes this possible. So if you just compare a conventional heat-powered reactor with a light-powered reactor, you see it's very, very different. Of course, you have to go to high temperatures. As I said, you need steel. You need a very, a very expensive capital investment to build a chemical plant. So you need high alloy steel, and you use fossil fuels, actually, for your energy. So that's very expensive. So let's compare that to light-based chemical reaction. Again, or li a li light-based light reactor. Again, we have to rely on a new technology, that is solid-state lighting. So we use electricity. It's even better if it's green electricity. Right? Electricity to power solid-state lighting, to power LEDs. <clears throat> and at that, at, with, that with, that, with that reaction, 
you can actually do that reaction at about 300 degrees Celsius, which means you could do it in your oven at home, actually, if you had the right plumbing. So you can use, do it in glass or plastic, as they said, or aluminum. And so the costs are much, much lower. To build a system, you could actually build a system everywhere, anywhere that you have a gas station. You could have a little hydrogen generation sta uh, station. Syzygy's photocatalyst is a nanoparticle system that is made up of two parts. It is composed of a larger, light-harvesting plasmonic nanoparticle, which is covered with much smaller catalyst nanoparticles. Photons are made using high-efficiency LEDs, and these photons interact with the plasmonic nanoparticle to produce plasmons, which in turn energize the catalyst nanoparticles. This interaction causes the catalyst to generate high-energy electrons that are able to make or break chemical bonds. Inside of Syzygy's reactor, this basic process of using photons to perform chemical reactions happens more than one trillion times per second. Ultimately, this is how our chemical reactors work. So Syzygy has gone in a very short period of time from five employees, in fact, you saw all the original employees in that first video, to more than 40 employees. And they're one commercial step away from actually the full scale up for a, for a hydrogen generator. So this little mock-up that you see actually would be about this, about this height, right? So it is something that could, could actually be installed at a, at, at, a, at a gas station. What's exciting about it is, of course, as I mentioned, lightweight materials, it uses electricity. But also, the fact that it uses light means when you t turn light on and turn light off, that you can, um, that, that basically the hydrogen starts, you turn light off, the hydrogen stops. And so it's tremendous control of the chemical reaction. So with that, I, have, I just want to conclude by, again, thanking you so much for the honor of, uh, of, of receiving a, a doctorate honoris causa from, from UTT. Uh, as I, started, I talked about prostate cancer therapy, and this is, uh, this is Art Rastenhan, as in his, uh, in his role as a urology surgeon, and this is patient number one for the clinical trial that he treated. Patient number one's name is Martin Feeney. Martin Feeney came in on the Monday for an injection of nanoparticles. On Tuesday, he had his treatment. On Thursday, he rode a bicycle. And on the weekend, he and his wife had a very romantic weekend. More information than we really needed to know. But this is actually, you can see why they're smiling. So <clears throat> to go from there to, oh, to a very, very different field, but the same theme is nanoparticles in light, nanoparticles that you can design to actually solve an important problem. And the antenna reactor is a, is a nanoparticle like that that has a tremendous future in, in taking chemistry away from heat and moving chemistry into a light-based uh, discipline that's run on electricity and not on fossil fuel. So with that, I would like to also thank the many, many people. This is just a recent a pre-COVID snapshot of my research group. And I have many other collaborators that I would want to thank. First of all, Peter Nordlander, who is also uh, here for the nanophotonics uh, celebration as a co-inventor on the, on, on the, the antenna reactor uh, work. We also work with an outstanding uh, uh, quantum chemist, uh, theorist, Emily Carter, who helps us understand these chemical reactions. And of course, you've already met the CEO of Syzygy, uh, Trevor Best, and his CTO, Suman Karawada, who are leading the commercialization effort. So with that, I want to thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Professor Hara, thank you very much for this presentation, which I followed one of the first times 
without almost reading my emails, which means that I was really <laughs> grabbed by the subject. Um, and uh, um, what uh, I would like to uh, on the, um, uh, to, to, to point out is what, what su surprised me in, in, in uh, your presentation is uh, seemingly a very short way between research and uh, valorization and entrepreneurship. Because as far as I understand, you have presented two startups which uh, one is, is in nano uh, particles and the other one in uh, involving the renewable energies in generating hydrogen uh, how long does it take to to uh, from from uh, research part to a startup and uh, to these uh, astonishing results how, how long in time and uh, how much in money that's a great question, and the two differ tremendously. Um, the, uh, the cancer therapy, we got intention very early on, and we connected up with business partners and, and our earliest investors. And then things really slowed down for several reasons. So first of all, you must have a lot of safety trials. And then, of course, there were nanotoxicology concerns about uh, 15 years ago. So the t it took a very long time to go from our original work, which actually started 20 years ago. 2001 was the first time we injected nanoshells into a mouse. But um, as, I said, as I said already, the real niche application of prostate cancer it wasn't even possible until about 2012 when this revolution of fusion imaging really enabled this very precise placement of the nanoparticles, precise imaging so you could solve a problem that was just absolutely insolvable by other technology. And that's an important thing to remember when you have a general technology, it's very hard sometimes to identify what could be the right, uh, the, the, the right solution that your, that your technology is good for. Um, and, but now things are moving along very, very rapidly, even though there was a very sort of slow period. And during that period, there were angel investors that were involved with, with keeping the company moving forward. The company also did a lot of research grants as well, so this, that also uh, were able to sustain themselves very well. Syzygy has moved forward much more rapidly. Um, they, they, are, uh, they, 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 they came to our doorstep to our offices and said, we want to commercialize this when they saw our first paper in 2016. And the, the, the duo, they're um, just an amazing, young, you know, incredibly energetic duo of people who really understood the technology. And they were able to develop a business plan, get investors very, very quickly. In so the spring, they raised $25 million, which was their second fundraise. And they, as I said, they have more than 40 employees now. And so they are moving forward with this combination of the, of the nanoparticles that, that have come out of our laboratory and then also developing a light-based reactor which did not exist until they made the choice to, to actually commercialize. They had a great background as engineers and also one of them as a, a, as a, a trained in business. So that combination has actually been able to propel that very, very uh, rapidly forward. So their investors are MIT. MIT considers this their technology. Actually, it's very cute. Um, but also uh, other com Equinor, which is a Norwegian company. Um, so uh, there, are, there are many corporate investors as well as, uh, as well as private investors that make up their support. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm very shy, so if I stutter, <laughs> please <laughs> excuse me in advance. Uh, actually, uh, it's not a question. I. But I really wanted to tell you these few words, Professor Haas. Um, I know that Monsieur Bachelot already praised you enough, but uh, I wanted to say that you're the proof that women can do it all and in a pair of heels. So <laughs> I'm very proud <laughs> and very happy um, because I had the chance to attend your presentation and uh, be, um, how to say it, um, a wit a w and witness and have the possibility to witness uh, your incredible achievements. 
Uh, and the fact that you came from a chemistry background and physics and have all this knowledge in all these different fields, especially in the medical field, um, is very impressive. So thanks for being such an inspiration for us. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Alice. Uh, we will now have a short musical break with Aurélien Jouy again, playing Claude Debussy's Arabesque Number no. 1.
Thank you again, Aurelia. Now, let's welcome Associate Professor Timothy Toury, Director of the European University of Technology, EUT+. Dear all, awarding an honoris causa doctorate is recognizing the value, the values in which an institution believes it's recognizing an exceptional implementation of these values. It is recognizing that one needs people to carry them forward. It means recognizing daring, ambitious, courageous choices. It means recognizing the force of carrying this out and completing it with success. It is recognizing the courage to take risks again when might have taken one's careers as a given. Dear Professor Brian Norton, this is where you inspire us. Before giving a necessarily partial presentation of your prolific career, I will give two elements that impress. You started research in the early 80s on solar energy, natural energies more than 40 years ago. At that time, it was an almost unknown subject. Actually, it was not recognized as such. You were a pioneer. In 2020, you completed the merger of three Institute of Technology to create the Technological University Dublin with a fully new campus. Brian Norton, you are professor at the Technological University Dublin. You are the head of the energy research of the Tyndall National Institute of Cork, employing 600 people. Your research has deeply impacted the development of solar energy, daylightning, and building energy technologies. You are the author of two books, co-author of more than 10 books, and more than 210 journal papers with over 11,000 citations. You are the first researcher cited globally in daylightning. You are currently the principal investigator and research area lead of the more 18 million funded Marine and Renewable Energy Ireland National Research Consortium. Professor Brian Norton, you have a PhD degree in applied energy from Cranfield University and a DSc in environment, environmental engineering from the University of Nottingham. You were Dean of Engineering and built environment At, Univers at University of Ulster, where you were professor of built environmental engineering. You have supervised nearly 50 PhD students, providing an important outreach to the research methodology you have developed. You were an editor in chief of Foundation and Trends in Renewable Energy. You served as an associate editor of Solar Energy, the premier, journal, premier international journal in the field, and served on six other editorial boards. You have received many sanctions. Amongst others, member of the Royal, Royal Irish Academy, fellow of the Irish Academy of Engineering, member of the Energy Panel and member of European Academy's Scientific Advisory Council, chair of the Committee on the Future Research Committee for Ireland, vice president of the European Sustainable Energy Innovation Alliance. You are a fellow of the Re Energy Institute and Engineers Ireland, a chartered engineer both in Ireland and the UK, and fellow Higher Education Academy. You have been many times awarded for your research achievement. You were a ministerial appointee for National Skills Council. In 2002, you were made honorary fellow of the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineer. You were an honorary professor of the University of Ulster and the Harbin Institute of Technology, China and an adjunct professor at University of Houston, USA. You were an invited member of the Institutional Evaluation Panel of the European University Association. The list is still long. The time available to me would not allow to be exhaustive. Do not blame me. More particularly, you have undertaken major work on the following topics. Building integrated photovoltaics, photovoltaic system optimization, glazing and daylight, passive space heating of buildings, window technology, building climatology, timber processing, solar energy water heaters, solar dryers, thermal design of glass houses, optical illumination concentrating solar collectors, non coventing salt gradient solar ponds, optimization of solar energy system, 
solar radiation prediction and measurement, economic and environmental appraisal of solar energy application, and solar cooling, cooling and refrigeration. Please understand that this is not just a list, but steps on a path that did not yet exist. When you started addressing this subject, it was not recognized. There were no dedicated funding. It was assumed that solar for buildings did not make sense in our latitudes. It is thanks to work like yours and to a later political awareness that it has, <coughs> is that it has become a recognized research subject and also an engineering subject. You have opened a question, a subject. You believed in it and put all your energy into it. You were, you are a visionary. Under your leadership, major research groups have been established at the Dublin Institute of Technology, University of Ulster, and Cranfield University with a common approach of extensive original theoretical work that are validated rigorously using both controlled environmental environments and outdoor experimental facilities together with long-term performance monitoring of practical applications. Many domestic school and office buildings directly embody the results of your research and new technologies emanating from your research have been patented and commercialized industrially now. Your research activity would have made up for more than a lifetime of academic work. And, of course, you have also touched extensively. You have also taken many responsibilities. You were president of Dublin Institute for Technology, DIT, from 2003 to 2019. DIT was Ireland's largest and most diverse third-level institution. You then analyzed the positioning and strategy of DIT and technological education in Ireland. Around 2010, you initiated a reflection on the merger of several technical institutes to make a technological university. There was no law yet allowing this, but you anticipated the question. The task was tremendous. It involved grouping together numerous campuses spread across Dublin, financing them and creating a new institution that would gather 3,500 academic staff and 28,000 students. During your presidency, you identified the land needed, you raised the funds, 500 million euro, and launch the reflection on a truly university campus. A campus designed for learning by doing. A campus that is a mean to an end. A campus built after the thought, why would you go to the campus? On a very last subject, I would like to underline the fact that your action for the Europe, European University of Technology has been discreet but decisive. I would like to thank you personally very much for this. Brian, you command respect and inspire us. You are a complete and visionary academic. By accepting this honoris causa doctorate, you are honoring us. Let us take you as a model. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Turi. And now we'll listen to Professor Brian Norton. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I'm deeply honored to receive the award of Doctor of Philosophy honoris causa. Um, and reflecting on Timothy's very generous words, any achievements that I have are always due to others, due to a whole range of very dedicated colleagues over many years in, in many institutions who've, uh, perhaps foolishly sometimes, but certainly have followed me in what I want to do and have, have, have led those institutions to beyond what they thought they could achieve. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, my family because uh, these things don't happen. Uh, these, there, there's a saying in Irish that uh, uh, behind every great man there's a woman pushing. And, uh, and I think things that don't, uh, don't happen automatically, and I'd like to thank my wife, Bahara, who's here, and my youngest son, Ayan, who's here, and my other son, Pedro, and daughter, Parisa, who can't be here this afternoon. For this talk, I'm going to talk about the importance of research in higher education, 
and, some, and separately about some of the challenges presented in striving to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. So to start with the importance of research in higher education. Higher education's fundamental purposes are the creation, transmission, and preservation of knowledge. Whilst each of these can and do take place outside higher education, it is their combination in academia, in university settings, that creates unique synergies, produces a continuum between research, scholarship, and teaching. Exposure to research can keep the content of teaching contemporary, as conducting research ensures canons of knowledge, the intrinsic nature and scope of academic disciplines are never considered immutable. Importantly, ensuring that social, technical, and political choices and decisions are based on rationality and evidence is a key contribution that research outcomes from higher education can make to an effectively functioning, participative, and inclusive society. Higher education's significant, but not sole contribution to this, relies on strong, research-informed teaching. This, in turn, requires maintaining a broad research base across the full range of higher education institutions that span the full range of disciplines. Only then can be the confidence that has been placed the true capability to educate and develop students to become graduates who participate actively in engaged and critical citizenship. Higher education with a strong, broad research base of PhD students, in particular, opportunities to involve themselves in the deepest intellectual understanding of a topic, but also to acquire the knowledge, skills, and ethics that enable each PhD student to truly examine and frame critically what they discover within much wider pertinent scientific, technical, cultural, social, and indeed commercial contexts. And that particular aspect of the link between research and higher education is a particular reason to celebrate today on the anniversary of a doctoral school. To provide this broad educational base requires an equally broad and diverse set of cultural, linguistic, and in the broadest sense, environmental perspectives. To do this, international cooperation is critical. Initiatives such as the European University of Technology provide a structure for such cooperation that's not only strategic and structural, but also really profound and pervasive across multiple partner institutions. This is in marked contrast to the often transient and localised, being really between constituent departments, constituent departments rather than between whole universities of many academic collaborations to date. However, deep cooperation presents challenges for institutional autonomy on the one hand, and for nationally based regulation and accreditation on the other. However, the benefits of such cooperation to the formation, Bildung if you want the German term, there is no single equivalent in English, of graduates are incalculable and should be pursued. Now, if I may, I'd like to turn to my second topic, quite different, the challenges presented in striving to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. And this has already been touched on in Professor Hallis's excellent presentation. A green post-COVID economic recovery will boister economies by creating sophisticated industries and supply chains. While addressing climate change, implementation of a clean and resilient economic recovery will create employment in the businesses of and for a net zero carbon future. As you heard, my particular interest is in the built environment. I'm going to focus on that particular area, but there are many, many other aspects. Versatile, resilient and economically beneficial clean and sustainable energy technologies are diverse. They include wind and solar energy, heat pumps, electric vehicles, energy storage, and are all underpinned by a multiplicity of diverse information systems and new business models. 
alongside a transition to zero carbon buildings, and those who attended my lecture this morning will know a lot about that now, additional low carbon electricity and heat production systems combined with associated energy storage will be critical components of future net zero carbon systems. The deep energy retrofit, essentially renovation or refurbishment of existing buildings is essential. It both improves a building's energy efficiency as well as enabling local renewable energy production as it usually involves building integrated photovoltaic electricity production. Deep energy uh, renovation of existing buildings is a stimulus to clean economic growth that can create new jobs. Enabling households to have low energy bills also reduces fuel poverty by increasing disposable incomes. As well as more daylight, thermal comfort and insulation, making homes warmer also reduces COVID risk factors as cold, cold homes increase vulnerability to respiratory diseases. If I can, for a moment, focus a little more detail on daylighting technology, the need for greater energy efficiency in buildings, combined with the requirement for improved human comfort, have driven interest in increased use of daylight. And for those of you who think this, this is ubiquitous uh, and is not an area of research, I am going to surprise you. The variable and intermittent nature of daylight calls for daylight enhancing technologies that can be used to provide daylight when skies are very cloudy or overcast. And this, as I say, perhaps surprisingly, presents some very fun fundamental research challenges. In my own current research, we are developing luminescent devices uh, pertinent for a university that has activity in, in, in nanoparticles and quantum dots that can directly capture, concentrate, and propagate daylight deeper into buildings as well as modifying its spectrum to meet the requirements of non-visual receptors in the eye that control circadian rhythms. Such luminescent systems can extend the period for which daylight can be used, can promote effective biorhythmic health, so greater use of, buildings, greater use of daylight in buildings thus displaces the energy and greenhouse gas emissions associated with artificial lighting, but additionally promotes health and well-being. More generally, building design and renovation increasingly have to take into account the need to be resilient in the face of the growing frequency of extreme weather conditions and other effects of climate change. Heat waves are becoming increasingly important as a consequence of climate change. It is expected the frequency, length and intensity of heat waves will increase. Indoor temperatures can be considerably higher than outdoors when heat, during heat waves and combined with polluted emissions pose a health risk. Concentrations of outdoor pollution can rise during heat waves and cause higher air pollution within buildings than would be the case, say, if you had air conditioning, owing to the opening of windows. Unless building adaptation measures are taken, this will lead to increased premature mortality, passive measures to avoid uh, buildings overheating in summer, well insulated to avoid winter heat loss, such as solar shading, heat storage in the building fabric, and night ventilation should be the first step in building design. Although even with such passive measures, increased use of high efficiency air conditioning to cool indoor air may become unavoidable. However, waste heat from air conditioning contributes to producing urban heat islands and will increase both electricity consumption and greenhouse gas emissions until the electricity supplies that power them become fully decarbonised. It can be difficult to address urban heat islands when renovating existing buildings. These are not the only challenges. Water damage and moisture in buildings like to become more common owing to more extreme rainfall and flood events. Homes continue to be built too close to rivers, lakes and the sea, despite expected increases in flooding due to climate change. The concerns of this have become all too evident in many parts of Europe this summer. But we should not despair. Shaping economic development that responds to the multiple threats posed by climate change, if done well, will lead to a more inclusive society as well as de deliver economic benefits. It provides a commitment to investing appropriately in evidence-based energy research and innovation that will lead to new and exciting businesses 
and produce professionals to provide low carbon design, new construction systems, and innovative advanced technology components. We cannot revert to old business as usual models. The fork in the road we now see before us is a unique opportunity to either drive forward to a resilient, just, and climate smart economic recovery, or perpetually produce greenhouse gases at incalculable human cost. So to conclude by bringing my two perhaps quite disparate themes together, research on the global climate itself is universal. But perhaps surprisingly again, addressing the consequences of climate change can be very contextualized by local factors ranging from weather changes, the instantaneous outcomes of climate change, culture, for example, prevalent architectural forms, to society, economics, and available and ethical technological solutions. So although addressing global challenges obviously needs international cooperation, such cooperation must be founded on enabling a deep understanding of each milieu of local factors. Only then can the outcomes of research in particular be relevant to and delineated for specific local contexts. All this needs the insights, understanding and empathy that will arise from well-structured cooperation in higher education, such as the European University of Technology. I would like to take this opportunity to wish that important issue all possible success. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And as Professor Hallis was invited questions, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, this is working. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I can only agree on the um, importance of research, um, but uh, yeah, I also would like your opinion on, on something else that has always been important, but I think to me it's been especially important in the last year or so, is also to try to um, go outside uh, our research environment and, and, and tell people basically what is research and what we do. Um, so is that I mean, of course, this is important for, uh, you know, sustainable energy, but not just in general. So what's your, yeah. what's your take on this? It is, uh, I think it's very close to my heart. Currently, I'm on a group that is uh, an expert committee for an exercise the Irish government is doing to literally open up public consultation, totally open public consultation, posters, billboards, television adverts, social media, etc., on what is it important to know. What, what, what don't we know we should know, and, and, and ask people. And that both in itself is intrinsically important to do, but has an important consequence that it is actually informing a public debate about rigorous, scientific, technical, cultural research, and getting an understanding of what that actually involves. Because when you're deep in something, you think the rest of the world knows what you do. They do not. Uh, even our undergraduates, I don't know if we have any here, in universities, are only dimly aware that research takes place and what, what its consequences are. So it's important there's public information about research. And if, as researchers, we're expecting ultimately taxpayers for various grants things to pay for that, they need to be making an informed choice that what they're doing is valuable, it is appropriate and timely, it's ethical, and these things need to be considered. So it's so very important. And I think it that, that act researchers should not be afraid to be public intellectuals, to, to take every opportunity to explain what they do, to enter into debate. And sometimes that's felt to be uh, not as important as seeking high-ranked publications or whatever. But actually it is, because actually it's the raison d'etre why we're there. Thank you very much, Professor Norton. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, President Kaur will now award the insignia 
to the honoris causa doctors.
Mrs. Norton, please, could you come up on the stage? Brian, if you, if you could bear with us. Mrs. Norton, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations again on your career achievements. Um, our final guest today is Ms. Fabienne Blaise, Rectrice Déléguée for Higher Education, Research and Innovation for the Grand Est region. I'll speak French. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Halas. Professor Norton, Monsieur le Président, cher Pierre, Mesdames et Messieurs, en groupe de grades et qualités, chers étudiants, chères étudiantes, euh, d'ailleurs merci pour, euh, pour les musiciens qui montrent que les étudiants euh, ont beaucoup de talent. C'est un honneur pour, pour moi de participer à cette, à cette cérémonie et je tiens tout d'abord à, à mon tour à féliciter les professeurs qui sont honorés aujourd'hui. Congratulations and thank you for all you do. Les cérémonies de doctorat honoris causa sont toujours une belle occasion de célébrer ce cas de meilleure l'université. Vous êtes en effet, madame, monsieur, l'incarnation de l'excellence dans les missions qui sont celles de l'université. Excellence dans ce que peut apporter la recherche de très très haut niveau à l'innovation. Vous témoignez également au mieux de la nécessité de développer l'interdisciplinarité et de l'importance d'intensifier les partenariats internationaux pour une science qui se, qui, qui se doit euh, d'explorer, de partager, pour explorer toujours plus loin les domaines de la connaissance, ceci dans l'intérêt du développement de nos sociétés, de leur économie, dans l'intérêt de leur bien-être, et objectif majeur dont le monde a enfin pris conscience, vous témoignez de la nécessité, de l'urgence même, d'intégrer dans les préoccupations de la recherche ce qui peut contribuer au développement durable de nos sociétés et au respect de leur environnement. Vous êtes donc, et cela a été dit, un modèle pour nous tous, et il convient de remercier l'Université de Technologie de Troyes pour le choix qu'elle a fait. Ce choix illustre sa recherche de l'excellence, son souci d'allier recherche et innovation technologique, et je pense que l'on peut l'ajouter au vu de ce qu'elle développe, notamment en matière de formation, son souci d'allier recherche et innovation pédagogique et sociale. Ce choix témoigne aussi de la volonté de l'UTT de s'ouvrir toujours davantage sur le monde et sur les partenariats essentiels pour la recherche que permet cette ouverture. Ce n'est pas un hasard si l'UTT porte une université européenne dont l'objet est de développer avec ses sept partenaires une vision de l'université qui réunit tout ce que je viens d'évoquer, développer une technologie avant tout humaine, 
faire de la diversité un atout, du multilinguisme une opportunité et développer une université inclusive pour tous. Tout ceci résumé sous l'idée du « think human first ». Je pense que j'ai <rire> bien regardé donc, ce qui concerne le UT plus et, euh, et ses objectifs dont je la félicite. Ces projets d'université européenne ont été promulgués par la ministre Frédérique Vidal, précisément au nom des valeurs qu'affirme votre université européenne, EUT plus. Alors, merci donc à vous, professeur Hallas et Norton pour votre rapport à la recherche, à l'innovation, au rayonnement de la science. Et merci aussi au président de l'UTT, cher Pierre, et à son équipe, pour nous donner l'occasion, à travers cette cérémonie, de rappeler ce que recherche et innovation ont d'absolument fondamental pour nos sociétés. And once again, congratulations. I will now invite all the members of the Gowns Committee to come up on stage, please, for the official pictures. Now you're all invited to a, a drink, soft or not in uh, M104, the first floor. We are all invited to a verre of l'amitié in M104, on the premier étage. Tous ceux que, qui le souhaitent, ça leur donnera l'occasion d'échanger aussi informellement avec nos invités. Alors, merci à tous.